covering the latest in entertainment and beyond since 2011. You're listening to the RCWR Show. And now your host, as featured on Wrestling Inc. and TNA Insider, Lee Sanders. Movie buffs may best know him for his work on Sex and the City, a show which I used to check out religiously back in the day with my mother, rest her soul. Loved the show too. He was also in 2006, The Devil Wears Parada and 2008's The Reader. He's been a huge fan of wrestling for many years and he's taken that love, that passion, that drive to form Kayfabe Commentaries. Dot com, which is basically like the home for some of the best shoot interviews, documentaries on wrestling that you'll be able to find. Let me just say, this man, he needs to be nicknamed Mr. Smooth Oliver because that's just what he is every time he interviews someone. Smooth. Ladies and gents, host of Breaking K Fabe and the You Shoot series, Mr. Sean Smooth Oliver. Sean. How you doing, buddy? You are hired. <laughs> you just need to shadow me everywhere. Uh, if you can do that, the job is yours. Well, thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Before I walk into a room, you start with that spiel, and then, you know, I will enter and, and wave for a while, and then we'll run away. We'll go to the next place. No one has to talk to me and realize I'm an idiot. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. How you doing tonight, sir? I'm good. Now, I, sh- I should prep you and your fans. This interview is going to be far less interesting than the Nina Hartley interview. <laughs> so if anyone out there is planning their night and wants to know how long to stick around for the show, you might want to jump in when I'm off and we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, something else. Very, very much something else. <laughs> I'm sure I probably did a serious 180 on the folks that thought they were going to be hearing some moaning and groaning with that Nina interview. I mean, seriously. Uh, thank you for taking the time out to do this. As I had mentioned before we came on here, I've been a fan of your work for a while now. Hey, you know, your journey to the point of where you're at right now in life, I just think it's a really interesting one as you've gone from Hollywood actor to being what I think is one of the most respected personalities in the wrestling business. I'm aware you've been a fan for many years, but can you go a little bit in depth about that moment that had you go, you know what, I want to get involved deeply in wrestling and not just be outside looking in? Um, the, the, the aha moment, if there is one, was uh, back in 2007. I was, uh, another facet of my life, I was working on Wall Street um, on the cusp of finance. Uh, for an investment bank, and I was sitting high atop Manhattan, and my now business partner, but at that time friend, Anthony, called me and said, you know what, about the only thing that's never been done with wrestling so far is having guys do that mystery science theater thing, but having them do it with their own matches. So all these matches that you've seen can have a new twist finally as somebody talks you through the match in real time a commentary track for historic wrestling matches. So that's what we launched with, thus the commentaries part of k commentaries. So we had guys come in and record uh, audio to uh, against picture to historic wrestling matches. And um, we couldn't sell the matches, obviously. We, don't know, we didn't own any of the rights, but we had the MP3s downloadable and, and able to be purchased on our site. So that's what we launched with. Uh, shortly after that, I thought we should move toward video. I thought that that's where it was at. I thought that the shoot interview market uh, in general was uh, kind of a wasteland. The concept of the shoot interview and and the the appealing factor of them was the peek behind the curtain. And that's how we first saw that stuff start popping up in, uh, you know, the tape trading days, 95, uh, 96. And, You know, people attacked this market with a voracious appetite to know more. For the first time, we had the guy sit down for two and three and sometimes four hours behind. It was the magician showing us what was up the sleeve and how it was done. And it, it, it whet people's appetite so much. So, but I thought we could do it better. And I had been in the entertainment business also for, you know, since I was in my teens. So on both sides of the camera. So I knew production wise, I knew we could outdo anything that was out there. Um, 
and I knew that content-wise, we could write and format this programming. Prior to, you know, for the first 10 or 15 years of its existence, the shoot interview was just the camera sitting there and letting someone ramble. I said, God, we could do so much more with this. We could format it. Um, so we launched with the Guest Booker series. And I don't even know if it was going to be a series. We launched, we launched with the first one. It was very much a pilot with Kevin Sullivan. And, uh, and it took off, and it got a lot of attention. And so then we did a couple of follow-ups to Guest Booker. Then we launched the You Shoot concept where fans conduct the interviews through video and emailed questions. Then I started to look at it differently again and said, wow, well, we, you can kind of run this like a network or the old studio system where we could have um, uh, several ongoing series, different takes on the shoot interview concept. The backdrop is always the same, so to speak, where you got wrestlers, wrestling personalities talking about the inner workings of the business. But we can format it all differently. And that's, and that's really what the genesis of the, of, of the company, as we know today, was. Wow. That's a very interesting journey. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about being innovative and, and kind of being on that cutting edge because, yeah, I feel exactly what you're talking about. It's like most of the shoot interviews that you see, it's like exactly what you said, literally. It's just somebody in front of a camera and they're just rambling. There's not really any direction. There's not really, okay, well, kind of like when you're watching your favorite movie or whatever, it's like if you were to just see the same scene, the same frame or whatever, after a while, you're going to get bored unless you take the different angles and all that. And, yeah, I definitely see what you're talking about when I think about some of the uh, stuff that you do with the U-Shoot, uh, with the Breaking K Fabe and all that. It's it's good stuff. It's rare I get an opportunity to chat with really anybody because I mainly do the show solo by myself here. But I promised one of my colleagues I was going to ask you this question because every single time they bring it up, they look online. They can never find it. So I promised them I was going to ask this question. You're so flawless as far as like your interview skills. You handle yourself in such a great way that you can pretty much spar with the best of them. Why haven't we seen you in the WWE TNA or ROH? Because a lot of folks, including myself, feel you'd be a great acquisition to any of those three promotions or any promotion. Have you been approached by them in the past or anything? Well, listen, if I went to work for them, in a, an announcing capacity or something like that, then they wouldn't be able to go online, check the latest kayfabe commentaries release, rebrand it, and put it out as their own. There'd be nobody writing for them anymore. They wouldn't be able to go on to kayfabecommentaries.com and see a series like Wrestling's Most, where we get professional wrestlers to come in and help us count down the most outrageous moments, controversial moments, most crappy gimmicks. And they wouldn't be able to take that and go, hey, let's call that countdown and put that on WWE Network. They wouldn't be able to take a series like My Side of the Story, repackage it and call it Greatest Rivalries with Bret Hart and and uh, and, and, uh, and Shawn Michaels. Um, I digress. Um, I wouldn't have the autonomy working for the majors to be able to do this. So the things that, you, you know, you're probably far more complimentary than you should be, but it just adds to the evidence that I want you to follow me around – um, but whatever you're, you're saying that you see in what I do with the Kayfabe Commentaries product would be compromised. I wouldn't be able to go free form like I do on WWE. I'd have to sit there and hold a mic in some somebody's face who's giving scripted lines into a, the camera. Um, the things that are wonderful about Kayfabe Commentaries would cease to exist. So um, they shouldn't want me. Uh, fans shouldn't want me there because, uh, it, you know, they've never allowed me to keep this company. And unless they were going to uh, adopt the kayfabe commentary sensibility to the program, but they could never do that because, the, you know, the big question I get from people is, uh, do you fear that because WWE now is doing a lot of shoot-style programming and you kind of shown them the way that that they're just going to kind of run with it? You know, we know Apple didn't invite invent, rather, the MP3 player, but they brought it to mass market. And that can never happen to us because the one thing we've got on our side is the ability to be honest. They can't tell the whole story about stuff. They can't allow guys to go on and talk openly and honestly about the steroid trial, the sex scandal in 92. Um, they can't allow them to do that. So their historical tellings have to be sanitized and and edited, 
And the whole thing about our about our product is fans can be uh, assured that talent is allowed to speak their mind. And we'd never air, air anything that was you know slanderous, but um, there's that freedom to retell history as that person saw it, and that would be gone in the majors. I didn't think about it from that standpoint. Yeah, because now that you mention it, yeah, that would seriously, not unless they're going to sign some type of a contract that would just let you have a lot of creative freedom and you can just continue to do what you want with kayfabe commentaries. And I, But I, don't, I wouldn't see them even entertaining that. Nah, not that you broke it down like that. They'd be crazy to, quite honestly. They'd be, uh, they'd be open to all kinds of uh, uh, exposés that they would probably prefer to have behind them. Has a promotion, though, any promotion, not necessarily those main three, but has a promotion tried to hit you up in the past and say, hey, we'd love it if maybe you could do something with us? There was a time where um, I was talking to people and they were talking to me. <laughs> and... Um, what I really wanted, though, I, I think maybe they wanted me, but what I wanted to give them was a product. I wanted Kayfabe Commentaries to produce a line of programming for them. Um, and uh, and it never came to pass, but uh, I, I think they, they probably feared a lot of what we just discussed. But um, this company, which was a solid number two at the time, I thought could have benefited from being able to say, we got nothing to hide. Let's go, unleashed, unchained. This is, you know, this is the new, this is the the new way to do things. That kind of marketing, bottom up marketing, that pe you know, people assembling in the streets kind of mentality, getting behind your company. And that's how we got so big. We don't buy. We we spend a little bit of money on advertising now, but when we started, we didn't. It was all word of mouth. It was all people going, man, these guys put a lot into this thing. I'm used to, you know, shoot interviews being um, a little drier than this and, and maybe um, somewhat repetitious. This is formatted. This is slick. This is written. <laughs> Just some forethought that went into this. There's post-production. Um, people, and we, and we were, because we were fans, too, we, you know, we have that in our blood. We were able to deliver exactly what these people wanted to see. I mean, fans that write us all the time, we, we you strike a nerve with people when you can kind of crawl inside their head and deliver the type of programming that they so desperately crave. And if you stay honest and you, and you stay true to it, they'll be with you forever, and and they'll they'll be in the foxhole with you. We have the most loyal, dedicated fans. I mean, I don't know they've taken to call themselves the Kayfabe Commandos, and you know, I, it's I I can only I can only posit a guess that it's because. We don't compromise, and we deliver exactly what they want to see. I definitely agree with that, and I'm definitely a huge fan, as I had said earlier. I want to ask you, because I had wrote a review for one of the Breaking Kayfabes that you had did, and I always said to myself, if I had the opportunity to chat with you, and, and, and here we are now, I would ask you this. I had did a review, and I'll send you the link. I was very nice with the review. You had sat down with Marty Jannetty, and um, I remember part of the review that I had said, I'm only going to say a part of it. It was basically, man, you couldn't help but feel for Sean because he had to constantly keep trying to get Jannetty back on point because Jannetty just seemed really distracted and everything. My question to you, because I don't know if you maybe heard, I'm sure you heard this, but I know a lot of fans were like, Janetti sounded very incoherent during that interview and everything. Was that like what you had got like during the phone conversations leading up to sitting down and taping the interview? Or, I mean, can you shed some light for that? Because for a lot of fans, they were kind of like, this isn't what I was expecting. Well, Marty, that's Marty. Uh, that's, you know, and, and we could sit here and, you know, try and extrapolate all the, all the, all the reasons that he sounds how he does. And, but, but that's Marty, and uh, the raw footage was about two and a half hours, I think a little more. The show was edited into a one hour and 15 minute clear conversation between two people. Um, it was not that in the raw footage. Uh, if I showed you the raw footage, uh, you'd be shocked that we, I was able to make it as clear and concise as it was. The only reason I'm telling you that is because afterwards, 
people, I guess, started posting on the Internet some stuff about that they thought Marty was screwed up. And I can tell you that from the moment he got there to the moment he left the set, he didn't so much as take a sip of a beer or consume any illegal drugs. And he was with me the whole time. He was at the table for the two and a half hours. Mm. Um, yeah, he was probably tired, but I, he didn't. He didn't do anything. He was professional. He was there on time. And that was it. Um, but since then, because people were bringing up, you know, that they thought he was somewhat incoherent, Marty got mad at me and accused me of doing a botched job of cut and paste in the editing to make him look that way, where if I didn't edit it, it would have been much worse for everybody involved. I like Marty. I wish Marty well. I do wish Marty uh, felt a little better about the interview. I thought that I thought that the interview was productive. I don't think we encouraged any kind of negative behavior or glorified any negative behavior. I think it was an, it was a description of someone's interesting journey, and Marty has had a journey. Um, I wish he felt better about it. He doesn't. There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, because. I remember from my review, because I actually had pulled it up right before we came on the air, because I really wasn't sure, but I backtracked, and I was very kind about it. I said, you know, he told some really great stories. If you can, you, for me, I had to crank my volume up on my TV to really be able to understand, but the stories that he was telling, it was definitely insightful. You could really get into it. My whole thing was I couldn't really make out a lot of the things he was saying but other than that it was definitely a, a great dvd i'm surprised that it had ran that long but then again when i think about it he did kind of seem like he was a little long-winded when you were bringing up uh several points and he would just run off with it yeah i mean the, the final running time was an hour and 15 i think uh in the final edit or an hour and 10 something like that and yeah i, I thought it was it was an interesting interview in, in its final form I want to pick your brain on some random topics. You can talk about it as long as you want. If you don't want to talk about it, just say next. But I'm just curious to get your thoughts because it's like you're rare that I get to kick back and pick on a beautiful mind such as yours. Let me say it that way. Um, let me get your thoughts on Daniel Bryan as WWE. Is that what you're going to ask me? <laughs> no. <laughs> what's, what's your thoughts on Daniel Bryan as WWE champion? Oh, boy. Um, <clears throat> interesting. The people demanded it, didn't they? Do we always <laughs> give the people what they want? Um, I'm 41 years old. I came, I came from a time where watching the wrestling product, uh, Harley Race was your heavyweight champion for a couple of years. And then Rick was the world heavyweight champion for a couple of years. Bruno for, you know, 13 years combined or whatever. Hogan five years or whatever it was, Backlund, four years, um, or all, all formidable names, all filled a very central role in the company at the time. The belt was the spotlight. You put it on someone who was going to uh, embody certain qualities. So I have to dis disassociate from that belief to talk about today's product because it's very different. WWE is a public company. They're answerable to stockholders ratings, more so than ever now. So they have to make the popular decision. People forget about this when they talk about Daniel Bryan's chant. They have to make the popular decision. They have to make the decision that keeps people happy. They have to keep people tuning in and buying product and having a positive effect on that share price. Wrestling can no longer be run like it was before where you can do a tease and keep people apart for a long time. And it's okay if you send the people home unhappy for you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, because they come up and still come. You've really got to deliver what makes them happy. Now, I think they saw what happened at Royal Rumble, when, you know, with Daniel Bryan, and said, Oof, we really, you know, we don't want a backlash. Maybe we got to go in this direction. So was it the right business decision? Yes, of course. Was it the right wrestling decision? Cause of the product I grew up on, I would say no. That's nothing against Brian Danielson. He's a remarkable talent. It has been for years and years and years. Of course, it took WWE forever to realize it, and I, I don't think they use him well enough to showcase his talent. But he's a great talent. Nothing against him. But I'm more traditionalist, I guess, than my heart with that. But listen, if I was CEO of WWE, homeboy would be wearing the strap. 
and I'd be doing the dance right, right, right in front of the, uh, right in front of the stock market. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. How about your thoughts on Undertaker's streak ending? Um, the, the great that they did it. You know, I like the, uh, I like the. I like the surprise. That's why we watch. Every once in a while, we get surprised. Um, I'm confused as to why it was Brock. Um, what a great way to give a rocket uh, a rocket left push to the moon, the proverbial rocket to the moon, daddy, for some <laughs> young buck that you wanted to make a nice singles monster out of for a while that's going to be around and not come around once or twice a year. For a 1.5 million dollar paycheck, you got it. You got it under contract and make him a star. Not sure why that didn't happen. That still just rattles my brain to this day, Sean. I, I don't know why it was Lesnar. I'd buy it if he was going to be doing a full time thing, but I, I just the way it is right now. I I don't know. I'm hoping maybe as time progresses, maybe Lesnar will say, you know what, I'm starting to fall in love with this again. Let's go full time. We'll see what happens with that. How about passing of the Ultimate Warrior? Creepy, really creepy. Um, creepy because if you extract lines from, and this is one of those you know hindsight things. You look back. How many people's passings? I guess could you look back at days or weeks prior and and uh, and extract some what you consider to be foreshadowing, but may have just been coincidence. But because of the proximity of the Hall of Fame event and, more importantly, Raw, to his passing, uh, that whole, you know, man takes his last breath, it, 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 it seems somewhat um, somewhat cryptic even watching it. But, you know, Warrior kind of has that rambling thing sometimes, so you don't pay much, much mind to it. But I was shocked, shocked uh, when I'd heard... Um, that he died. Another an, a tragedy from from another perspective too. Of course, it's the loss of, of of a man first and foremost, and a father. You know, I, I can't help but think of those two little girls at the at the Hall of Fame. But but how great that he he called them up and had that moment with them um, publicly, and he was a husband. Secondary to that, he's another guy in the business that uh, I don't think we got to know enough about. What's left of the Warrior is that goofy documentary um, that they're going to put out now to try and cover up the documentary, the nasty one that they put out a few years ago, which good luck finding that now. Um, mm -hmm. And his own ramblings and rants that probably weren't very well thought out when he fired up the webcam and used to you know put those uh, web logs up. Um, that's really all we have left. Nobody sat down. He did do one shoot interview. He was, it, it wasn't very well done, and um, and he wasn't uh, particularly forthcoming with a lot of information on it. But uh, nobody sat down to really get to know him on camera. Same thing with Macho. I talked about this last night on on another show, and Macho is another guy because he was so reclusive. There's no shoot footage of him anywhere. I think any of the the radio shows he used to do, he, he was he was working. Um, so nobody got to have Macho share his gifts, and he was amazingly talented, more so than than Warrior. Warrior drew a great buck, but uh, Macho had the had the gift of gab and and in ring work. He was great all around. So those are, those are two real tragedies, two uh, two passings of people that we really did not get to know as fans. Adds to their mystique a little, but. Uh, but also uh, as the gravity of their passing. What's your thoughts about Sting in the WWE? This seems to somewhat be official now. We've seen him on the network. Uh, also, it looks like WWE is going to be uh, preparing to release a DVD on him. Looks like this September. Well, you know, damn it, let's wait till they're sixty. That's what I say, WWE. <laughs> let's wait till they're all, let's wait till they're all sixty, and they can come out and. You know, we can we can do the legend thing with them, and you know, we can't really put them in the ring to work too much, and you know, put them in there from an obligatory WrestleMania match or stick them in a corner or something. I mean, God, really, what do I think about this thing in WWE? Well, let's see how they use. It. Uh, no, you you said it right. Seriously, there's only one positive thing I've been able to say about staying in the WWE. I mean, for one, 
it's great that he's finally going there because you know what? He should end his career on a high note. I don't know why so many people, my friends, my colleagues, everybody keeps saying the same thing. Sting versus Undertaker. It's like, you really want to see that. You want to see those two up there guys go at it at a WrestleMania. No, thank you. I don't want to see that. I like how they've been introducing him. They've been bringing him in on the WWE Network. I think that's a smart move because think about it, Sean. Like, if you were to have him pop up, like, I don't know, St. Louis for episode of Monday Night Raw, they aren't going to really know who he is. Just think back to that um, old school edition of Raw in Baltimore. Jake the Snake came out, and he barely got a reaction. Well, you know, because the people that you're talking to that want to see Sting there, they're not the guys, they're not the age group, they're not the demographic that buys the tickets to go to the shows. So, you know, they're not 16. You know, they remember Sting... Back from the paint days, you know, the uh, I mean, the you know, the colorful pastelli fun kind of paint days, um, and so yeah, so old farts like us, we have this uh, kind of historical nostalgic reason uh, motivation behind of uh, behind our want to see Sting. Kids say they don't give a rat's ass. If your idol is is John Cena, what what Sting popping out going to do for you? Tune in, I guess, but. It, you know, yeah, okay. Send them out on send them out on high note. Get that DVD out there. Get some get some decent money in the guy's hand. He's been in business forever. Um, sure, good for Sting. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Good for Sting. <laughs> How about the future of WWE pay per views? I definitely want to pick your brain on that one because uh, it looks like there was a WWE press conference today, and uh, of which it looks like the network had brought in 4.4 million dollars in subscription revenue at the end of the quarter, but there was a $1 million loss in the pay-per-view revenue. WWE thought that they were going to have their 1 million subscribers for the network to break even, but the uh, way it's looking right now, folks, they got a disappointing 600 k for subscribers. Sean, add on top of that, DirecTV, Dish Network, and now I believe it's, is it called AT and TU or whatever? Uh, looks like they're dropping WWE pay-per-views and are now going to be approaching them on a month-to-month -month basis as other providers are expected to follow. Why could I have seen all of this? And they couldn't. I said from Jump Street, I don't know how this is going to work well for them. Um, first of all, there's, yes, at a basic, basic business level, there's the denial of pay-per-view revenue now. Um, I guess they're counting on some buys for stuff here and there. WrestleMania got some buys outside of network, you know, uh, fees, the 9.99 network deal. Um, but their pay-per-views went from $35, $40, $50 a month to $9.99 a month, in essence. Now, to do that, you've got to make up for the difference in volume. And it's about it's a three to five hundred percent difference. So your volume of buys, monthly network subscribers, has to go up hundreds of percent points beyond what they were getting on paper. Did they think there were that many fans sitting around out there to make up for that difference? If the, if, the, if it's not going to be mutually exclusive pay per view to a to a subscription buy? Now, that's a very basic thing. That's the obvious thing. The more subtle thing comes from the business pages of any of the major papers or business papers. Uh, media conglomerates have their hand in everything. Your cable companies have their hand in networks, have their hand in pay-per-view, obviously because they're a cable company, uh, have their hand on broadcast cable like USA Network. So how is a company like Comcast which now owns NBC Universal, which owns USA Networks, going to treat that renegotiation of that raw contract when WWF just went, oh, remember all that pay three revenue you used to get from us, Comcast? You're not getting it anymore because we're going to do this network thing. So you could expect about a 50% at least drop off on your pay-per-view buys. So how's Comcast going to try and make up for that next time they have to sit down and they have to make up that gap in fees? They'll hit them on raw. So the, 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 the transmission fees will be higher. I didn't see how this was going to work. I don't know how they're going to get their foot out of the trap here. Um, 
straight wrestling. They've, they've always done very well. Um, I, I think when the family business uh, tries to be a little more business savvy than I think they are, I mean, I guess I, they hire they hire the best, I guess. They have the money to bring people in. Why can't consultants tell them this isn't going to work? The ghosts of XFL and WBF and WWE Films will stand behind McMahon's desk as he goes to sign the contract for WWE Network. Why don't those ghosts matter? I'm trying to think about it. What about if they were to just crop the pay-per-view buys? I mean... 40 50 60 dollars is ridiculous i understand wwe's got their whole thing with the network but if wwe is seriously interested in keeping that relationship with the cable providers because it's that new outlet and hey you have that pay-per-view outlet you're hoping that you can bring in a new audience to come in and check out the shows on the usa sci-fi whatever how about maybe dropping the price for the cable providers to like god twenty dollars or twenty five do you think maybe that could even work you know what the answer to that is why am i paying twenty five when i can pay nine ninety nine every freaking pay-per-view at ten bucks in those subscribers compared to pay-per-view buys can make up the difference or they're going to look to get that revenue some other way they're going to have to hit us to make us buy something else how about the current state of tna wrestling Minus Hulk Hogan, AJ Styles. Now you got to add in there Christopher Daniels, Kazarian, as the company's been trying to do their best to usher in new talent. Do you ever stand over your 95-year-old grandfather's bed as he's been in a coma for the last three years? As the family all looks at each other and goes, I, I, I don't know why he's still breathing. I, I, do, we, do we let him keep breathing? He hasn't opened his eyes in five years. I guess we got to stay here, right? We got to say he's alive. He's technically alive. See all those machines? He's alive. That's kind of like what it is to watch TNA now, isn't it? Once in a while, it's kind of interesting, but I, I tell you, there's some points where I look at it and I, I just shake my head and I just say, man, I can't believe I'm seeing this. The, the product I saw, I mean, people, TNA is a, a favorite punchline for wrestling fans, uh, and I, I wasn't always on that bandwagon. I, I thought they made some earnest a few years ago, three, four years ago, when they started doing the peek behind the door promos, um, kind of like fly on the wall stuff, as opposed to the WRF style, which nobody has yet to explain to me um, how we're supposed to accept the fact that the, you know this quote unquote private conversation is having and there's a camera right on us. I mean, we're, we're we have to have that kind of sitcom mentality where we're pretending there's no cameras. Um, so I liked when TNA, and it was probably Russo at the time, who did that, let's peek behind the door, and, you know, we're not supposed to be seeing this. So th that added an, an air of legitimacy to the uh, whatever angle they were trying to do. So I thought stuff like that was a good shot, a, a good attempt at doing something different. Um, the the talent, you know, that has passed through there has been good. Um but more recently, the problems have become exacerbated by, by bad decisions. And I think probably the last year or two, especially the fact that they're publicly shopping it around and stuff, and so it kind of weakens the product a little, knowing that the bosses who want you to watch want to get rid of it. You know? It's like a fire sale. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm telling you, every single week I cover Impact Wrestling, I try very hard, and our listeners, they know, I try to be very optimistic about the product, but I'm telling you, sometimes there are some weeks where it's just so nerve-wracking. It's like, what the hell? Why, why, why am I watching this? And I actually ask myself that, and I have to keep reminding myself I'm watching it because I love and support what these men and women are doing in the ring, but my God can... We please, please get out of this funk, you know? <laughs> I think that the, the new general manager, Nina Hartley, would change everything as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Dildo on a pole match? Come on, I'm there. Um, but outside of that, if that can't happen, um, with Shane Douglas' new promotion getting started, with Ring of Honor having a loyal following, um, Companies like like uh, Dragon Gate and uh, Evolve, 
WWE is something so completely different right now from wrestling. There is wrestling that happens on that show, but it's with with WWE films and it's it's they're concentrated on something very different. So let's set them aside for a minute. If we had a very interesting and competitive uh, B level wrestling scene, Triple A, let's call it, not the Mexican Federation, but the Baseball League. Um, that consisted of all these other companies that got some TV somewhere. I'm not talking about, you know, the indie feds running the Elks Lodge. I'm talking about people with some TV or some, some following on DVD, pay-per-view, iPay-per-view. Um, if there was a hot B-level, minor league, let's call it, wrestling scene, let's put TNA in there too, where they shared, where they shared talent, people to do eight months here, hop over, do a few months here, blah, 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 move people around, see how all the different federations use different people. I think fans would be very interested. TNA, from day one, has tried to compete directly with the WWE. I think they should take the great advantage they have of TV um, and use it to, to make uh, a very good secondary level size wrestling federation. Get out of the arena. When they were going to go on the road to the arenas for TV, I said, how's that going to work? Like, I couldn't believe it. Did, did, did their rank get jacked up so high at Universal that they left? They had a controlled environment, controlled costs, same place. You know, go out to your house shows and, you know, put a couple thousand people in the seats. But when they took the TV on the road, I said, oh, my God, this is, this is financial death. If, if you can't fill the arenas and you're drawing the wicked point eight every week. So I don't know how that was going to work. Um, teenage problem is they're trying to fight Godzilla, and they're not God. They're not Rodan, if you will. How's that for a filmic reference? About two weeks ago, when Eric Young had won the World Heavyweight Championship, then you see Dixie Carter the next week saying, basically, there's other companies out there that's trying to make a profit off of what I created. I'm the one that came up with the whole bearded look and all that, and it's like really. Are you really going in that direction? Because WWE isn't even thinking about you. They got the whole film, the music videos, and P. Diddy's, and all that good crap going on. They ain't thinking about you. Come on now. Yeah, it's never good. And we saw this with WW, um, WCW um, when the whole Monday Night Wars were going on. When you start acknowledging the other company, you lost. Mm -hmm. You're reacting. I forgot where I read this, but I use this as a as a as a business reference all the time for myself. Um, I wish I could credit who it was. It was probably one of the business magazines. But when you're firing upon the opponent, remember the old Revolutionary War days where they load, step, fire, load, step, fire, and they would advance. Eventually, whoever's taking the brunt of the artillery is going to begin to retreat, and they're going to bunker down. And they're going to raise their guns out of the foxhole to respond to the advancing army's fire. Are you responding to your competitor's fire? Or are you the one that continues to fire and advance and make others respond to you? The minute you're making a decision to do something because the other guys did X, Y, Z, you're in the foxhole, dude. So rather than return fire, which you have to do that to... to, to put out an emergency situation, you do that. But find out how you can start firing some shots. What products can you put out? What can you innovate? How can you make the other side retreat and start to respond to you? Look at Apple. Everybody returns fire at Apple. They march straight ahead. The fall and the further fall of Extreme Rising. I uh, just talked with Shane about that. We shot a breaking kayfabe, Shane Douglas or Troy Martin, as it's called. Um, <clears throat> which will be out this summer. Yeah. And um, as as he describes it, it was a host of bad decisions and uh, mismanagement uh, fr from his perspective. I haven't spoken to the other folks involved, but the story he tells is one of gross mismanagement um, and uh, something that was, that was not uh, directed by the fans or bad turnout or or, you know, disappointment in the product at first. Um, it was them not being able to run a business. Um, again, that's the story that Shane tells. 
Um, he's on. He's gone on to uh, start at, at the time. I think they were calling Classic Wrestling Federation. It may have changed now. The title was tentative, but uh, they're going balls to the wall with this uh, with this other product project, which is has a real um, high stakes uh, funding behind it. Some uh, some investor that he didn't reveal. Uh, so it looks like they're going to have the opportunity to at least do a, uh, a proper full on launch of their vision, whether it will catch on or be able to sustain at that level remains to be seen, but, um, they're going to try. I'm looking forward to checking out that DVD. You said it's coming out this summer. Uh, yeah, I think it's slated for, uh, July, early July. July. I'm going to have to put that on my list. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just so, when I found out, I was just so disgusted. It was like a punch in the gut. I mean, seriously, because we had been trying to spread the word about the promotion, like early on back when it was called extreme reunion and Sean, we had people that were like, why are you covering that promotion? That ain't doing nothing. You should be talking about this instead. And my whole argument was, well, it's nice to get that variety out there. You can't really call yourself a true wrestling fan when you're not checking out other promotions. You know, you go check it out, get that variety. And um, I just can't help but feel for not just the wrestlers, but the fans. And I mean, it definitely, at least in my opinion, I could be wrong, but to me, it just kind of gives a black eye to the indie circuit because you got all those guys out there, especially in that Philly area, they're like, man to see ECW come back and now it's like you got the funk of this promotion what's the other one that's been making headlines hardcore road trip both of those it's like two serious black guys and then you hear the good things that Tommy Dreamer's doing with the house of hardcore right and people are like wait a minute isn't that extreme rising then I don't have anything to do with that one yeah, the, the, the waters are a little muddy in that whole rebirth of the extreme thing. A lot of people are trying to cash in on it, and I know they're stepping on each other. You know what they need? They need some uh, Commissioner Nina Hartley. Extreme anal is what they need. Nina Hartley. <laughs> yes. Right, so. Yeah. Oh, that's sponsored by Anya Saul. <laughs> sponsored in part by Trojan condoms. <laughs> exactly. KY, <laughs> one stroke away from glory. <laughs> oh, my God. You, all right, so you told me about that DVD with Shane that's going to be coming up. What other projects you got coming up that's in the works? Well, the thing that's out right now that's making all the waves for us is uh, Roddy Piper's edition of Timeline, the History of WWE. Um, covers the year 1984, and that series, as you know, uh, we have it's a year by year uh, uh, study and history of WWE. We also have a spin off series for ECW as well as WCW, where we bring in one star and they cover one year from January through December. Uh, we bring up all the relevant events and get their first hand reaction. The idea was an open ended history so that the uh, viewers' DVD shelf would continue to grow, and they could add years and years to their uh, historical encapsulation of that federation, told by not historians, not researchers, the guys and gals that were there, so they could tell their firsthand account of the events that we talk about. And Roddy Piper covers 1984, just came out this month. Uh, some trailers available for it on our site, on our Facebook page. Uh, our site, by the way, I'm supposed to be a pitch man, aren't I? Uh, kfabecommentaries.com. Um, and uh, you can check us out on YouTube, uh, Twitter, at kfabecomment, and, uh, and on Facebook. So, yeah, Piper's, Piper's Timeline is doing it right now. We have an edition of Guest Booker coming up <clears throat> with Bruce Pritchard called Screwing Brett. Uh, Bruce mm. was one, one of just a couple of people who were – present after Brett and Sean's match in Survivor Series who were in the locker room with Vince and Brett. And, you know, Bruce was there for the weeks and months leading up to it in creative. So we talk about what was going on, what were the options, what was being discussed, uh, what was Vince saying behind closed doors. I mean, we got Brett's side on the DVD, but now we're going to go inside management's side. Um, and then we his rebooking exercise 
is how could we have booked Brett out of that problem? How could we have solved this? Um, and uh, another edition of Timeline History of ECW is coming this summer with Just Incredible. Um, Brett is going to be shooting an edition of Timeline 1992. Great stuff coming this year. I'm thrilled. And uh, don't forget, you shoot Insane Clown Posse, which just came out in March, much to the joy of the uh, wrestling purists that I have to listen to constantly. <laughs> I've been on the fence with that one. I, I mean, let, let me ask you, because I haven't seen the, the trailer yet. I'm not really into Insane Clown Posse, but if you tell me that, you know, it, it's worth checking out because you, you are chatting it up with them, I'll definitely check it out. Are, are you chatting it up with them? Absolutely. These guys are die-hard wrestling fans, period, first and foremost. They've had success in the music industry. They were wrestling fans as kids. They started backyard federations. They wanted to be wrestlers. They got to be wrestlers, of course, on you know the side entrance because of the music thing. Mm. But they love it and they respect it. And listen, are we going to talk about the armbar for two hours? No. Is not Nick Bockwinkle mentioned on this? I don't think so. Luthez, I don't think, is referenced once. Hans Mortier, um, we have the Bruno disc if you'd like to hear a discussion of Hans Mortier. Nonetheless, there's plenty of wrestling discussion with the clowns, but also a lot of crossover stuff, comparisons between the music business and the wrestling business. And They were in WCW, ECW, WWE, TNA, they were there for all the crazy times. So I think it's a wildly entertaining disc. And I can't tell you the number of reviews that started with I thought I was really going to hate this, but, and they may not throw their arms around it and embrace it by the end of the review, but they give it its due at least. So I think it is worth checking out. All right. I promise you I will put that on my list because I'm going to be doing some shopping this weekend online. I will definitely check that out, and I will definitely uh, do a review for it and and, uh, forward it to you guys and everything. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to checking out all that great stuff you guys got coming up. And, uh, Sean, you know, such an honor to have you on here tonight. Definitely, we got to do this again, man. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you uh, thank you to the fans that sat up for 50 minutes waiting for Nina Hartley. Is she coming on after me or is she coming on before me? Um, we, man, we, we blazed through her, like, real quick. Yeah, we had her on the table and everything, you know. Oh, well, you, that's, listen, that's, sometimes that's all it takes. A couple of good angles and, you know, the pop shot and it's over. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Talk about you, yeah, shoot, you shoot on Nina Hartley. I shot big time, yeah. It was it was it was pretty good. We we threw this one right into the toilet, didn't we? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> right into the toilet. You know it. <laughs> well, Sean, thank you so much, man. It really means a lot. Let's stay in touch, man. Do this again real soon. All right, be well. All right, you too. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Sean Smooth. Oliver, really a huge honor to have you on the show. We definitely got to do this again.